Thanks right. for coming back over. Appreciate it. And uh, what this is is a conversation, presentation on troubleshooting of pneumatic domain systems. It's really dilute phase systems. Um, dense phase systems are a little bit different. It's limited to dilute phase systems and, and uh, how you troubleshoot one. Uh, what's that? Stop talking a little louder. Are you talking louder? I'm trying. It's hard. Um, this is what a pneumatic conveying system looks like when it's working right. Everything's nice and pretty and shiny and everybody's happy. And uh, there's what it looks like when they're screaming. Um, in a pneumatic conveying system, there's really only four pieces of equipment you have to go look at. So it makes the troubleshooting a little bit easy. Just to, there's a blower package. Whether it's vacuum or pressure, there's a blower package in the system. And it only does two things. It gives you a volume of air and a pressure. There's a convey line, which just ties everything together. It's just a hole with some metal around it. There's not much that can go wrong with it. All it does is get you from A to B. Then there's the pneumatic receiver, the bin bin, at the end of the system. And all it bin bin or filter is is a wide spot in the river to separate the dirt and the air. Uh, and it's a physical barrier to make sure that the small particulates don't get out of the environment. And then you have the rotary valve, the fourth piece of equipment. The rotary airlock. It is a revolving door, just like in the hotels we all go through. It lets people through, and yet it keeps the pressure difference between the outside and the inside. Um, we always talk about in our industry that rotary airlock is a metering device, and it's an airlock, but it's a horrible device that does both at the same time. But it's the only device that can do both at the same time. So the best way to troubleshoot a, a dilute phase system is to look at just each piece of equipment individually and try to figure out where your problem is. And the blower package, it's the noisy piece, it's the big piece, it's the piece you go out and talk to. But quite honestly, it's usually only about 1% of the problem we ever have with the system. Um, I love that statement right there. If the blower package runs for a week, it's going to run for the next 20 years. Um, belts glaze, brakes, speed should never change. Pressure relief valve should never be opening. So when you walk up to a blower package, you're going to hear loud. And unless you hear clunking and banging and sparks flying out of it, it's probably not your source of problem. The only thing I would add to this is inlet filters. Sometimes they're overlooked, uh, but that is one thing. And I will in the next presentation. Inlet filters are something you need to be checked because they steal air volume. Um, the biggest problem with the blower package and its feedback is you only have one thing you can look at, the pressure gauge. Uh, it's your only indication of what's going on inside of the system. And what I would recommend any maintenance guy to do is take a magic marker and you put a mark right where the pressure gauge is and things are working well. And anytime things aren't working well, you can go look at it. And if that's still right there, you're still okay. So, but it's the only feedback device that's on a blower package is a simple pressure gauge. Um, Switch into the next line item. This next item is the convey line. Um, we have about 5% of the problems we have out in the field are from the convey line. Um, it's where lines wear out. If you're going to put a hole in a convey line, it's going to be in the elbow. It's very seldom ever going to be in a straight section of pipe. Um, here is a problem that people don't realize sometimes is if you add a bunch of convey line to a system, you will change how it runs. A lot of people will add another destination onto a system, add more line and diverter valve, and the performance falls off. And they go, why? Well, if you add more line, the rate's going to go down. But most of the time, that's not the deal. The other thing is, get used to walking up to your line and feeling it. You can actually touch your convey line to get an idea of what's going on inside. Better yet, stick your ear up next to it. You can actually hear the product going down the line, and you can actually hear how it's running. But again, it's only about 5% of the problems we have out there. Um, this is something you can see from the outside, the hardening of the arteries. Uh, I'll say this for the sugar people, this is a problem once in a while when you get wet sugar. You'll actually see a little bit of build up in the lines. The line gets smaller, the rate goes down, the pressures go up, but not, not a, a typical problem. Uh, gaskets and couplings, walk by them. Once you've installed them, you should never have to mess with them. So uh, this is the interesting one people don't think about sometimes is you cannot convey up an angle. Uh, it's the worst thing you can do to a pneumatic conveying system. Straight up, straight
straight sideways, never convey at an angle. Uh, filter receivers, bend bend. Not, again, 5% of the problems we see out in the field are from the, the filter receiver or bend bend. Uh, one of the biggest things is, bin bins and filter receivers on pneumatic conveying systems are not dust collectors, and they shouldn't be treated that way. A lot of people try to apply the same troubleshooting and stuff to a bin bin or a filter receiver than they do to a bag house, and they're really completely different animals. Dust collectors are made to run in, in dirty bags, and they have lots of volume, very little product, and filter receivers on pneumatic conveying systems, large amounts of product, very little air. Um, Round units can handle up to 15 feet of size, square units up to about 40 inches of water. And people open up the filters and see dirty bags and say, I've got dirty bags, i got a problem. Dirty bags are not a problem. Dirty bags actually make it more efficient. Um, very, very seldom do we ever have problems with the filters getting so dirty they become an issue. Filter receiver and fin bands only have one place you can go look for trouble, and that's the timer board. This timer board sits up top here and it controls the pulsing that clean the bag. Okay. You should never have to go in and adjust it. You set it once, you're done. Um, the only feedback you get is an indication of differential pressure. And that differential pressure should be somewhere between zero and six inches of water. Really, really low. And it shouldn't be changing. Steady is great, bouncing is bad, which means that you walk up to it on Monday and it says three inches of water, you come up on Friday and it says three inches of water, you're fine, not a problem. If it climbs throughout the day and has to recover, then you've got a problem of your filter, and that usually is a can velocity problem. Uh, but if it worked on Monday, Tuesday, it's kind of like a blower. Nothing can change what goes through your filter, but shouldn't ever change. Um, Again, the timer board has many functions. Uh, it's got all these adjustments in it, but again, as you're troubleshooting it, there's really nothing to change. Um, the next thing is sol solenoids and diaphragm valve. There's the solenoids up there, there's the diaphragm valve. That's what required, that's what is used to clean the bag. The electrical signal that sent from the timer board to the solenoids causes the air to be let off the back of these, that causes it to open up and send a pulse of air down the bag. It should sound like a rifle shot, not a whoosh. When I say I have problems with these things, it's about 5%, it's usually going to be right here. A diaphragm valve that's gone bad or a solenoid that's gone bad. It's usually not a sizing or a dirty bag issue. But you should be able to walk up and feel the pulse of air out of the bottom of every one of those solenoids, and you should be able to hear that rifle shot of the bang trying to snap the bag clean, you're not trying to blow it clean. And maintenance tends to forget to go up and look at these things because they're way up on top of the building, they're way up on, uh, out of the way. But we've had filters that quite honestly can have five or six of these things bad, and they work just fine. Um, it's not a typical problem area. Rotary valves though, not the rest of the problem. Um, I don't know what they added up to at this point, but I would tell you this is a very true statement. No matter what, 80% of the problems in a Duluth-based system are around the rotary valve. They are a very precision device put into a horrible environment. Um, that valve right there is 30 inches in diameter. I, standing next to that, it comes in front of the here on me, and yet the tolerance is between the, the veins and the housing is 5 thousandths of an inch. Okay? They're put into a horrible, horrible environment every day. Um, they leave our factory at 4,000, 6,000 of inch tolerance and considered wore out at 15,000. That's not a lot, and it doesn't take much, and the valve is shot. And wear is slow and internal, meaning that it takes a long time to wear out a rotary valve. Uh, Speaking with Great Lakes Calcium, they just changed product, though, and they learned that that's not totally true. You can wear them out in a period of less than a year. Um, but the hard thing is, is it's internal to the valve. You can't see it when you walk by it that it's wore out. Uh, once it's installed, it's really hard. Underneath the silo, completely full of sugar, you can't take that valve off and measure it. And then, if you do try to measure it, where are you measure it? Um, 
This is a picture of our shop in Kansas City. We stock rotary valves. We sell about 20 to 40 a week to leave our facility. It's a humongous business, rotary valves. Everybody in this plant, this building right now that sells rotary valves, it's awesome because they wear out. They don't wear out every day, but they always wear out. It's the one thing that does. Um, it's the hardest part to diagnose because there's nothing we can do to be able to predict it or measure it, how fast it's going to wear out. All of the wears on the inside of the valve, so you walk up to the outside of it, you can't tell that it is completely wore out. I love this statement, where is the wear? It's not predictable, it's not even, and it's a slow process. I talk about corporate memory as a way to determine rotary valve wear. And what happens at a plant uh, is that in January the system plugs up and everybody gets excited, they go out, they bang on things, they somehow get it cleared and it starts running again. And then sometime in June it plugs up again. And everybody runs out there and they, and they get it unplugged and they get it going. Well, then it happens in, in August and then November, December. What happens is the frequency of, way, of plugage starts happening more and more and more and everybody goes, what the heck going on? Well, if you're intuitive enough to think about it, you go, wait a minute, we started having plugging problems a year ago and that frequency is starting to happen more and more and more. That is a very turn, very common rotary valve wear diagnosis. Is the frequency starting to happen more and more and more? Uh, but it takes a very good maintenance staff that reports it. The biggest problem is that nobody ever goes and checks it to see if that's where it is. They, they get the line unplugged some other way. They, they stand on the pressure relief valve. They bang on the pipes. They get it clear. They didn't realize it was actually leaking back in the valve that was causing the problem. This is a picture of a valve we got back. Um, and I talk about where is the wear and how do you measure it. If you look at this valve, one side of it's destroyed. The other side is perfectly fine. So if you were to look at this valve from the top and happen to have the veins in the wrong spot, you would see this and you'd say, my valve's fine. If you didn't see that, you would never know. And so you can come in and measure. Sometimes people will tell you, take a feeler gauge and go out and measure your valve. Well, it's underneath the bottom of the silo, so how do you do it? And if you do drop the pan off the bottom, stick a feeler gauge up, and you stuck it up on this side, you'd say, my valve's fine. If you were lucky enough to stick it up on that side, you'd say, wait a minute, I got a destroyed valve. There's another example. Perfectly good on one side, completely destroyed on the other side. Um, there's the other opposite problem to wear, which is buildup. Uh, I'll speak to my sugar people again. This is a problem with sugar valves. Right here, wet sugar gets inside the pockets and fills it up, or fills up a few, or you get buildup on the outside that causes problems, but you can't see either one of these problems from the outside of the valve. This one, you might be lucky, and you walk by, you can hear it squealing. And that would tell you you're getting some buildup. But for the most part, either one of those problems, you can't diagnose from the outside. All that happens is, here, your rate falls off, and your pressure falls off. But everything's running and it's fine. So, what you can do when you start to have problems inside of a rotary valve is, rates drop. All of a sudden, instead of doing 20,000 pounds an hour, we're doing 10. This is the reason, as you wear out the valve, air is going up through the valve into your silo instead of down your line, and your fill efficiency in the rotary valve goes to heck. Uh, normal fill efficiency on a valve is about 70% on a pressure system. When this starts to happen, it goes to 60, it goes to 50. It's just so much air is leaking up, and it's not going down the line anymore, and so all of a sudden your rate starts falling up. And like I mentioned here, the frequency of the lines start to, the frequency of the lines plugging start going up. You can also walk back to your blower, and I showed you that pressure gauge. That pressure gauge should be solid, sitting at one number. If that thing is bouncing up and down, the rotary valve wear is going to be a good indication. It's nothing wrong with the blower, it's actually happening at the rotary valve. So, in summary, in a dilute phase system, whether it be pressure or vacuum, there's only four pieces of things to look at. The bay line, blower package, airlock, and the filter. There's probably where the problem is. Nine out of 
same time, just go straight to that rotary valve and ask me where it's at. And the best way to diagnose rotary valve wear is the frequency issue. If the frequency of your problem is starting to increase, it's typically a rotary valve. Question. That was quick. So, I got two extremes of people here. I've got sugar people who have buildup problems and wet sugar problems, and I have Great Lakes Calcium, which has got wear issues. Um, they've been going over to our Type 8 airlocks, which are ceramic coated valves, to try to get some more life out of them uh, and having good success. But, are there any questions?